Variga the of Lestater, Saidna, my dear friends. Let me begin by greeting you with the words Christ is in our midst. It's truly a blessing for me to be with you today, and having had the opportunity to spend this week together in this special, a very special gathering. We are gathered here because of God's grace. We are also gathered here because of the prayers of others. Over the course of years and decades and even centuries, faithful men and women have prayed for the unity of Christ's church. In their prayers, they have responded to the divine initiative. They've responded to the love of God in Christ through the Spirit. They have prayed that the divisions among us will be healed, that those who are separated will be reconciled. And throughout the ages, even to this very day, these prayers have reflected the prayer of our Lord, that all may be one as he and the Father are one. We can never know the full force of these prayers. But we seem to catch a glimpse of their fruits. Each time we discover an increase in love, a deepening of understanding, a willingness to forgive, a desire to break down walls of division, and most importantly, and perhaps the most difficult, a willingness to change. Change for the sake of the gospel. One of the ancient, most ancient prayers of the church which we have says this, as the elements of this bread once scattered over the mountains were gathered together and made one, so also may it be with your church. Build it up from every nation, country, town, and village, from every house, and make it one living Catholic church. This simple prayer from the Ephogologion of Serapion, a fourth century prayer book, expresses the concern of the church for unity probably at a time when the church was deeply divided over the Arian heresy. The words of the prayer reflect, of course, the reference to bread in the New Testament, but the words also reflect another prayer, a prayer found in an earlier document, the Didache, which Bishop Callistos has already alluded to. And this prayer says this, As this broken bread was scattered over the hills and then when gathered became one, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. The liturgy of St. Basil picks up the same theme. A portion of the anaphora says this, Gather those who have been scattered, Bring back those who have wandered away and unite us all in your holy Catholic and apostolic church. And a bit further on, the prayer says, put an end to the schisms among the churches, stop the raging of the nations, and prevent heresy by the power of your spirit. I have always been challenged and intrigued by these simple prayers. Again, some of the most ancient prayers that have come down to us through Christian history. They are prayers coming to us from the Eucharist. They are prayers offered at a time when the community was celebrating its oneness in Christ. And yet, they are also prayers which seem to recognize the tragedy of division. Recognize, as Father Raymond said the other night, that something's not quite right when we gather together to offer the Eucharist 
and to know that there is division among us. For Orthodox, for Eastern Catholics, and for Roman Catholics, we have not lost this connection between our prayers and our concern for the unity of Christ's Church. In the liturgical petitions of the Eastern Church, we frequently pray for the stability of the Holy Churches of God and for the union of all. We pray for the unity of faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Within the Roman Church, the prayer of the faithful often contains a petition for unity and reconciliation. And for Roman Catholics, the fourth Eucharistic prayer reflects elements of earlier prayers when it says, Lord, look upon this sacrifice which you have given to your church, and by your Holy Spirit gather all who share in this one bread and one cup into the one body of Christ, a living sacrifice of praise. With these prayers in mind, I want to reflect for a few moments this morning, especially on the difficulties of our division and the opportunities for our reconciliation. Thinking especially of the work, the theological work that has been done by dialogues between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, both at the local level here in North America and at the global level. Our conference reveals to us both a foretaste of our unity as well as an expression of the tragedy of our division. During this week we have had the opportunity to gather together at the Eucharist as celebrated by the Orthodox, the Roman Catholic, and the Eastern Catholic Churches. Yet not all of us can participate fully in these Eucharists because we come from divided churches. We cannot share fully in these Eucharistic celebrations. And here we are confronted and in a certain sense confounded by the tragic consequences of our divisions. The Eucharist, which is truly a sign, a prayer for unity, has become, because of our human weakness and sin, also a sign of our divisions. At this point, if I had more time, this would be the opportunity to give you a little bit of a history of this gradual alienation estrangement which took place between East and West over the course of centuries. But since so much time is not available, let me simply highlight two aspects, I think two consequences, two recognitions maybe we could say, that historians have come to after looking at this history perhaps in a more reflective, a less polemic way. First thing, most would now say that the schism between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church is the result of a gradual process of estrangement. Historians will tell us that this estrangement begins perhaps as far back as the ninth century, if not earlier, and that it is actually difficult to date when communion between the churches was actually broken. Yes, the year 1054 is frequently mentioned. And we know that in fact some limited, I underline limited, excommunications were exchanged in the year 1054. 
But we now know that this was certainly not the date of the schism, despite what you read in your Western civilization textbooks, despite what you read in public relations uh, articles from our various churches. If you leave here with anything, leave here with the knowledge that 1054 is not the date of the schism. Some have suggested the date of 1204, the date of the infamous Fourth Crusade, the sack of Constantinople. Perhaps that date because at least we could identify the establishment of a parallel hierarchy in Constantinople. Others may suggest the date of 1484, when there was a council in Constantinople which, se which seems to have repudiated the decisions of the Council of Florence. Some would say the year 1729, when Rome formally opposed uh, granting communion to Eastern Orthodox. Some would say the year 1756, when another council in Constantinople advocated the rebaptism of Roman Catholics. When did the schism takes, take place? Perhaps it would be more honest to say we don't know exactly because we would have to be much more focused on particular places. When did it take place in Constantinople and Rome? When did it take place in Antioch? When did it take place in Jerusalem? What we can say is that certainly by the 15th century we know that something has gone radically wrong. And we know that this estrangement has taken place over the course of time. Second observation as a result of our less prejudiced understanding of history. Throughout much of our divided Christian history, worship has not only been a sign of our unity, but also a sign of our division. The divisions of the churches have not been expressed simply in doctrinal statements or in letters of excommunication. The divisions of the churches have also been expressed in and through worship. When differences in teaching were no longer acceptable and differences in practice were no longer acceptable, the division among the churches became manifest in the worship of the churches. In the old phrase, altar was set up against altar. Priest was pitted against priest. Congregation was pitted against congregation. With the development of divisions between our churches, the Eucharist itself became a visible, tangible expression of our division. Worship became the context through which our divisions were expressed. This, of course, does not necessarily mean that the unity of the churches requires uniformity in liturgical practices. Certainly it does not. Acceptable, division, acceptable differences in theological emphases and liturgical practices characterize the life of the early church prior to this uh, great schism. Yet as the alienation between our churches developed, differences in liturgical practices took on greater significance. These liturgical practices were twisted and in a certain sense became the expression of our divisions. Let's remember some interesting facts. 
the question of the filioque was highlighted only after it was discovered that Byzantine and Latin monks in Jerusalem in the ninth century were singing were singing a different creed something similar seems to have taken place in the mission fields of Moravia in the debate between the disciples of Cyril and Methodius and the Frankish missionaries. By the 11th century, the debate between East and West was over the type of Eucharist bread that was to be used. Should it be leavened, as was the Byzantine practice, or should it be le unleavened, as it was the Western practice? very tangible difference. By the 14th and 15th centuries, questions were being raised about the moment of consecration. Did the change take place at the so-called words of institution, or did the change take place at the time of the invocation of the Spirit? These questions were not debated without a polemical spirit. There was little sign of dialogue, true dialogue, in these discussions between East and West, between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Both churches claim to profess the true faith. Both churches use the same scripture and the same tradition and yet theologians from both churches were able to use both scripture and tradition to justify their liturgical differences and therefore to justify division within the church. And of course, in addition to this, we should also remember that those persons who are, let's say, unschooled in theology, for those persons, the visible differences expressed in worship became a visible expression of the division of the churches. In other words, people could see that there was something very different. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century raised new challenges for the Catholic Church especially. And in the wake of the fall of the Byzantine Empire in the previous century, the Orthodox themselves were not in a position to respond very well to new theological questions being raised by the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. Both uh, Catholicism and Orthodoxy developed a spirit of what could be called ecclesiological isolationism, ecclesiological exclusivism. Father George Florovsky describes this tragic situation when he says, the point was reached at which the memories of the common past were obliterated and faded away, and Christians came to live contentedly in their own particular and partial worlds, mistaking them for the Catholic whole. One of the most significant characteristics of Christianity in the 20th century, now I have to smile while we take the photograph here. Smile, okay. <laughs> That'll help. One of the most significant characteristics of Christianity in the 20th century is this tendency, this inclination 
towards reconciliation and the restoration of visible unity. This tendency has generally been described as the ecumenical movement. And we know for a fact that the years that have passed since the first decades of this century, 20th century, have witnessed a profound drive to understand the differences among the churches and to overcome the barriers to the restoration of visible unity. Clearly this process is not easy. Centuries of alienation, antagonism, mistrust, and bitter memories are not easily overcome. And yet today, in nearly every tradition of Christianity, people have come to see that the divisions among the churches can no longer be accepted as normative. Division is a scandal which compromises the gospel and which impedes the mission of the church in the world. Yes, there is an ultimate relationship between our faith and our mission. Can we in fact proclaim a God who calls all to unity and reconciliation if we ourselves are so divided? Here again, I would recall some very forceful words from Father George Florovsky. Let me quote. He says, We must seek unity and reunion, not because it might make us more efficient or better equipped in our historical struggle, but because unity is the divine imperative, the divine purpose and design, because it belongs to the very essence of Christianity. Christian unity means nothing less, Christian disunity means nothing less than the failure of Christians to be fully Christian. George Filarowski. Now it's time for audience participation. I kind of take a break at this point. How many here have a neighbor who does not belong to the same church that you belong to? Okay. I think Bishop Sevalon, Archbishop Sevalon's the only one who does this. <laughs> How many here have a close relative who belongs to a different church from yours? Almost everybody. That tells us something. A new relationship between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church began to take place in the 1960s, during the period of the Second Vatican Council and the period of what is called, or what are called the Pan-Orthodox Conferences. As early as 1963-1964, both the Vatican Council and the Pan-Orthodox Conferences express the desire, and we would say a dramatic desire, to seek the restoration of full communion between these churches. One of the most important ways in which this desire for the restoration of full communion was to express itself was the establishment of formal theological dialogue. And I would underline one of the ways, the establishment of formal theological dialogue. A formal bilateral dialogue between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church was established here in the United States in 1965. The dialogue was established by the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops and what is now the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. 
Again, very formal. This theological dialogue has met consistently for the past 35 years. It has produced 21 agreed statements on topics which affect both the lives of both of our churches. This has included topics which, uh, issues which divide the churches as well as teachings and practices which express essential identity of faith. Some have claimed that this dialogue here in America established in 1965 was the first time that Roman Catholic and Orthodox theologians met together formally, underline formally, since the Council of Florence in 1439. Some would claim that. It was not until 1975 that plans were announced to establish an international dialogue between the Orthodox and Catholic churches. In 1978, the formal document detailing the objectives and methodology of this dialogue was announced. And the document said this, in part, the purpose of the dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church is the reestablishment of full communion between these two churches. This communion, based upon unity of faith, according to the common experience and tradition of the early church, will find its expression in the common celebration of the Eucharist. In other words, from the very beginning of our discussions, both in the United States and at the global level, the focus has been upon re-establishment of communion. And the sign of unity will ultimately be the opportunity to celebrate the Eucharist together. Since the establishment of the International Commission, four agreed statements have been issued. The first on the mystery of the Church and the Eucharist in the light of the Trinity in 1982, the second on faith sacraments and the unity of the Church in 1987, the third the sacrament of ordination and the sacramental structure of the Church in 1988, and the most recent one in 1993, Uniatism, method of union of the past, and the present search for full communion. Perhaps most of you are familiar with this document, the so-called Balamand Statement. The International Commission has not met since 1993 in plenary session. This is because, primarily, of the difficulties which arose between Orthodoxy and Catholicism, especially in the region of the Balkans and Russia. The International Commission is scheduled to meet not very far from here, in Emmitsburg, this coming July. And fortunately, we've had the opportunity to have uh, some foretaste of this meeting from, uh, from Cardinal Keeler, who was with us. And you've heard about the icon from Sitka. You've heard about the opportunity for people to come together to pray for the fruitfulness of this meeting. The fact that the International Commission has not met in over eight years tells us that there are serious issues that need to be addressed by our churches. There is a certain sense a need for a realistic assessment of the relationship between our churches. The difficulties in Eastern Europe and in Russia have reminded us very forcefully that our divisions are not easily overcome. And although those of us who are blessed to live in this country and to experience the relationship which exists between, among, the Orthodox Eastern Catholic and Roman Catholic churches, although we are blessed with that experience, 
we have to realize that other parts of the world are not so blessed. That others still live in relative isolation. Not knowing each other. Not having the experience that we have of having relatives, friends, perhaps even husbands and wives who belong to the other church. Our world here in the States is different. And I would say thank God for that because we've come to sense the possibilities of reconciliation. But we who live here also have to recognize the difficulties that others are having in other parts of the world. But at the same time, in a positive vein, we must recognize that the relationships between our churches are not the same that they were 35 years ago, 300 years ago. In many places, there has been a remarkable positive development in the relationship among our churches. The formal and informal meeting of clergy and lay people for prayer, for study, for common witness have done much to eliminate the old animosities and antagonisms and misunderstandings. This gathering is one such example, a remarkable event, an event that would be impossible in other places. In the most recent statement of the Orthodox Roman Catholic Theological Consultation here in America, the theologian said this, and it's a bit of a long section, but let me read it to you. It says, we are convinced that a unique relationship exists between our churches in spite of our division. This relationship is rooted in the fact that we continue to proclaim and share the essentials, the essential elements of the apostolic faith. It is for this reason that in recent times the Catholic and Orthodox churches have been described as sister churches. And the consultation continues. The bonds that continue to unite our sister churches are powerfully expressed together or separately when we worship the Father through Christ in the Spirit and honor those who are close to God. While we have become separated as churches, our union with Christ and his saints has remained an unbreakable bond of faith, hope, and love. Through the life of both our churches, we share a special bond with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, and all the other saints who surround us as a cloud of witnesses. A remarkable statement. In a certain sense, the American theologians are pointing to the fact that there are degrees of communion. The goal of our dialogue, the goal of our life together, you might say, is to achieve full communion. To be able to join together in celebrating the Eucharist. And yet, there is a process, there is a path towards that goal. And along that path, you might say, there are signs of communion. We're not quite there yet, we're moving in the direction. And so we can pray together. We can join together in each other's liturgical celebrations. <clears throat> we have these opportunities to affirm that towards which we are looking. And again, this type of meeting certainly bears witness to the degree of communion that we already have among us.
Let me now turn specifically to the issue of the Eucharist as expressed in the bilateral dialogues. And again, I have to be somewhat brief. The Eucharist has been an important topic, a topic which has figured very prominently in the dialogue between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, both here in North America and at the international level. It's very interesting that the first subject that the American consultation took up was the topic of the Eucharist. Studied it for a number of years and finally produced an agreed statement in 1969. Again, probably the first statement coming from a dialogue group officially representing the two churches in hundreds of years. Likewise, at the international level, the Eucharist was central to the discussion, especially between the years 1978 and 1992. The International Commission produced its own statement on the Eucharist in the year 1982. And that statement was titled, as I said earlier, The Mystery of the Church and the Eucharist in the Light of the Mystery of the Trinity. Both of these documents are very significant. They express what could be called a high degree of consensus, of mutual understanding about the significance of the Eucharist in the life of the Church. These two documents, the one by the North American Committee and the one by the International Committee, seem to have set the stage for further discussions about other topics, but topics which were also related to the Eucharist. So, for example, the American Consultation produced a statement in 1989 on conciliarity and primacy in the Church, which devoted a great deal of attention to their Eucharist. And the International Consultation in the year 1988 produced a statement on the sacrament of orders in the sacramental structure of the Church, which also devoted time and attention to the Eucharist. Much can be said about what these theological consultations have said themselves about the Eucharist. But again, because of the press of time, I would like to emphasize three. We heard the importance of three the other day. Three particular points coming out of these discussions. First of all, our theologians are saying together, through the Eucharist, we proclaim the mighty and salutary actions of God. This proclamation is at once an anamnesis, a remembrance of God's actions, and truly an act of thanksgiving, Eucharistia, for the loving care of God. Through this remembrance and thanksgiving, we are drawn into the divine actions of love. In proclaiming the story, we become participants in the events we remember. Again, Father Raymond alluded to this sense of anamnesis. Listen to these words from the United States Consultation. Very simple says, the Eucharist is the memorial of the history of salvation, especially the life, death, and resurrection and glorification of Jesus Christ. In this Eucharistic meal, according to the promise of Christ, the Father sends the Spirit to consecrate the elements to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ and to sanctify the people. the Eucharist as remembrance and thanksgiving. Reminds us of the words from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. 
From non-existent you brought us into being and when we had fallen you raised us up again and you have not ceased doing everything until you lead us into heaven and grant us your future kingdom. For all these things we give thanks to you. Anamnesis, remembrance and thanksgiving. Second point our dialogues have made on the Eucharist. Through the assembly of the Eucharist, the Church manifests its deepest identity. The Church is a community of human persons who are in communion with the divine persons of the Trinity. There's an intimate and necessary connection between the actions of the triune God on the one hand and the Eucharist and the Church on the other. In other words, you can't separate them. We've heard this also in our discussions this week. Actions of God, Church, Eucharist, intimately related. Listen to the words of the International Dialogue. Now the Church's existence in a place is not formed in a radical sense by the persons who come together to establish it. There is a Jerusalem from on high which comes down from God, a communion which is the foundation of the community itself. The Church comes into being as a free gift, that of the new creation. And the statement continues, the mystery of the unity and love of many persons constitutes the real newness of Trinitarian kinonia, communicated to human persons in the Church through the Eucharist. This is why the Church finds its model, its origin, and its purpose in the mystery of God, one in three persons. That linkage between God's actions, our gathering as church, and our celebration of the Eucharist. <coughs> Here I recall the prayers from the third Eucharistic prayer of the Roman Church. From age to age you gather a people to yourself so that from east and west a perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. Eucharist, church, they're rooted in God's actions. In some sense we don't create church and therefore the church cannot be a club it can't be simply a organization of human fellowship. It's something which comes from God. The liturgy of St. James, listen to this prayer. O master and benefactor of all creation, O king of ages, receive your church which approaches you through your Christ and then fulfill what is useful for each of us. Bring us to perfection. Count us worthy of the grace of sharing in your holiness and gather us all together in your holy Catholic and apostolic church. God's action, gathering, Eucharist. Third point that our theologians are saying, together. The Eucharist is offered for the sake of the whole world. <clears throat> Bishop Kalisto spoke to us the other night about offering, offering. And in the end, we offer for the whole world. Bishop Nicholas alluded to this this morning. This is a theme which is expressed in the dialogue statements 
but one which we ourselves do not always take to heart. The divine revelation which finds its fulfillment in the coming of Christ has a significance for the whole world. Not simply for us who believe, not simply for us who gather to remember and give thanks, but for the whole world. And so it should not surprise us that in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, we say, we offer this spiritual and blood, unbloody worship for the entire world, for the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. How many of us remember that order? It's an interesting order. We offer first for the world. And remember later on in the, Neaf in the Anaphor, remember those who bring forth the fruits of good works in your holy churches, those who remember the poor. Bread, wine, the gifts of creation, offered up to God, and yet offered up, as we've heard from others, as the first fruits, a sign of the blessings we all have received and yet offered up for all. For the work of Christ is a work of salvation for all, not simply for us. And if we have anything to say to the world, it's the message that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And that our task in the world is to bear witness to that love. Again, let me cite the U.S. consultation in these words. In the Eucharistic celebration, we not only commend ourselves and each other and all our life to Christ, but at the same time, we accept the mandate of service of the gospel of Jesus Christ to mediate salvation to the world. Through the Eucharist, the believer is transformed into the glory of the Lord, and in this, the transfiguration of the whole cosmos is anticipated. Therefore, the faithful have the mission to witness to this transforming act of the Spirit. I remember what Father Taft said. It's not what we do that makes us holy. It's our relationship with God that makes us holy. And yet, as holy people, we have a responsibility to the world around us. Do you remember the words from the liturgy of St. Basil? O Lord and Master, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, look upon your servants who bow their heads to you. Bless them and sanctify them. Watch over them, confirm and strengthen them, and then Draw them away from all that is evil and urge them on to what is good. And again, I remember the prayer, the third Eucharistic prayer of the Roman Church, which says, Lord, may this sacrifice which has made our peace with you advance the peace and salvation of the world. The Eucharist is offered for the sake of the world. It's not a selfish action. It's not an action for ourselves alone.
a few words of conclusion. When the early Christian teachers, our teachers, our common teachers, reflected upon the reality of Christian divisions, it seems to me that two observations often predominated. Firstly, division among Christians is rooted in hardness of heart. Sounds so simple. This fundamental sin is at the root of our division. It is hardness of heart which leads to an unwillingness to reconcile, an unwillingness to listen, which leads to pride, to arrogance, to triumphalism, to the absence of love. St. Maximus the Confessor stated this case so clearly when he simply said this, Believe me, my children, nothing else has caused heresy and schism in the church but the fact that we do not love God and our neighbor. It sounds so simple, and yet it seems to bear witness to the power of love. Secondly, the early teachers of the church tell us that Christian reconciliation result, results not simply from doctrinal agreement. Now I'd be careful. That does not mean that doctrinal agreement is not important. And we know again from looking at the story of the early church how often the fathers struggled to creatively find the right words as best they could, recognizing the mystery, but also recognizing a certain obligation to find the words which would express the unity of the church. So it's not a matter of diminishing the significance of doctrinal agreement. It's a matter of recognizing the context of how we fashion and how we receive our agreements. History shows us that formal statements are absolutely necessary. But these formal statements need to be fashioned and need to be received by persons whose hearts are open to the healing power of God. And so the prayer of the church for unity, which is the theme of our gathering, the prayer of the church for unity is an absolute precondition for any discussion of doctrine or practice. It's an absolute precondition for any resolution of the differences among us. We need in our day and age to be attentive to the way we approach the issues of Christian division. The great issues of division which have divided our churches for centuries need to be addressed. We cannot ignore this obligation, no matter how frustrating and difficult it may be. But at the same time, these issues cannot be addressed without reference to the present state of our relationship and our relationship with God. We cannot ignore the fact that in recent years our prayers have changed us, 
have changed our churches and have changed the way we look upon many of the divisions that divide us. Yes, we can choose the way we approach our divisions. We can choose the way we do our theological reflection. We can choose the way we relate to our partners in dialogue. These divisions, in other words, will be healed only if we approach them with the mind of Christ. <clears throat> Let me conclude by citing again the most recent statement from the Orthodox Catholic Dialogue in America, which I think summarizes so well our present situation. The dialogue says, the ultimate goal of dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church is the restoration of full communion. We recognize that this is a gradual process. Just as our alienation took place over the course of time, so also our reconciliation under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is taking place gradually. In order to be faithful to our Lord, this process must be rooted in the gospel and nurtured by prayer for unity. It must be fostered by theological dialogue and expressed in acts of love and mutual forgiveness. As members of sister churches, we have the responsibility for upholding the apostolic faith. We cannot seek the victory of one tradition over the other. Rather, we seek the victory of Christ over our divisions for the salvation of all. To him be glory, together with his eternal Father and his all holy good and life-giving spirit now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Thank you for your attention.